Before I go into examples of the chain rule, a couple things to understand are that I'm not going to uh, be using the same notation as the textbook, but the notation used in the textbook is really helpful for how you think about things. And uh, secondly, I won't even be really using a formula, kind of like I when I went through with the um, product rule and the quotient rule, I'm using more the concept, but even more so here, it's still, you can, if you remember in patterns, I think you're going to find this to work out really, really nicely. I'm actually going to do two examples, each with a few different derivatives like this. The first set of examples are just to get the idea of the chain rule. I want you to see me go through some problems. I'm sure you can read the examples in the book, but seeing me go through them is a little bit different. And then after that, I'm going to show you some examples of the chain rule combined with other rules. So what you got to understand here is that when we do the chain rule, or the product rule, or the quotient rule, you can combine that with any other rule. And you have to get comfortable enough with these rules to be able to recognize when they make sense, when you need more than one, and that kind of thing. All right, so A is a classic kind of chain rule problem. Uh, so f of x is 6e to the 10x power. So when I look at f prime, the first thing I'm going to do is ignore that 6, because remember, we learned that the 6 can come out of the derivative, and focus on this term, e to the 10x e to the 10x is not e to the x, obviously. We have a rule for e to the x. e to the x, the derivative, is e to the x. What the chain rule says is, okay, you can pretend that that 10x is something else, but you're going to have to pay for it. You're going to have to multiply by its derivative. So you can treat it that way, but you can't completely do it. In other words, and remember, I'm keeping the 6, so here's the 6. I wish this was e to the x. If it was, e to the something, I would just keep this here, right? The power would stay the same because e to the x is e to the x. But it doesn't quite work out that way because this isn't an x. So now what I have to do, and this is the chain part, is I have to multiply by this piece that wasn't what I wanted it to be. I have to multiply by its derivative. And now I have 6e to the 10x times 10, which is 60e to the 10x. So as you can see, I have to multiply by the derivative of the inside. That's essentially what the notation that the textbook uses is doing. Multiply by the derivative of the inside function. You can imagine e to the x is the outside function, and what we've plugged into it is a 10x. Same idea with b, where we have g of x. When I look at g prime of x, I say, okay, if this was an ln x, I would just do 1 over x. I'm going to do that. 1 over the inside, but because the inside wasn't an x, I have to chain it out. I have to multiply by the derivative of that inside part. And now I end up with 1 over x squared minus 1 times 2x, which is written much nicer, 2x over x squared minus 1. So in this case, if you're using the book notation, the outside function is an ln x. The inside function is x squared minus 1. And then finally, I put k of x here because it's not an obvious chain rule problem. In fact, if you're really good, you notice, hey, this is a quotient, right? And I could use the quotient rule here. But I would say that that's actually overkill because I can rewrite this. Without doing any calculus, remember that uh, 1 over x to the n is x to the minus n power? I can rewrite this and say, actually, this is equal to x squared minus 5 to the negative 2 because it's in the bottom of a fraction with 1 on top. Well, why would that be useful? Well, now, if this was an x to the minus 2, that would just be a power rule. It's not an x to the minus 2, but I can sort of treat it that way with the chain rule. In other words, I can say, okay, k prime of x is going to be, well, let's just pretend this is an x. Then what I would do is bring that exponent down, minus 2, I'd keep the x, but it's not really an x, right? It's x squared minus 5. And then I'd subtract 1, I get minus 3. But since it was an x and I pretended it was, I have to multiply by the derivative of that piece that I pretended was just an x. So x squared minus 5 prime. So with the chain rule, you end up kind of doing two derivatives. Derivative of the outside function, derivative of the inside. Now all this stuff's going to stay. And then we end up with 2x out here for the x squared minus 5. Now, since this is minus 3, that's going to go on the bottom of a fraction. So this is minus 2 times 1 over 
x squared minus 5 cubed times 2x. And then I can multiply this 2x and the minus 2, and I end up with minus 4x, and then x squared minus 5 cubed. Once again, notice, outside function, inside function. And your textbook uses a u to represent this piece, and that can be a nice placeholder. But in the end, if you can just think inside function, outside function, you're doing the same thing as the textbook. Okay, now I told you I had two sets of examples. Different difficulty levels. The first three, classic chain rule. We only had to apply the chain rule once. Sometimes you have to apply it twice. You can sometimes have to apply it multiple times, although that's usually a made-up type of textbook problem. So let's look at the chain rule combined with other rules. Now notice A is almost the same as what I had before. What I had last time was 6e to the 10x, but now I changed I put an x in there. I have 6x e to the 10x. So what's going on with that? It's a product. There's nothing I can do here except for recognize, hey, this is 6x times e to the 10x. The e to the 10x, I'll have to use a chain rule on, but that's within the product. So you have to do the product rule first. So I'm going to say, okay, f prime of x will equal 6x e to the 10x plus, notice I'm writing out the product twice, 6x e to the 10x. First thing gets prime, second thing gets prime. All right, this is going to be 6e to the 10x plus 6x, and now I have e to the 10x prime. e to the 10x is a composite function. That's what uh, we use the chain rule on, meaning it's like an e to the x, but you plugged in another function for the x. You plugged in a 10x where that x would normally be. So you take the derivative like normal, but then the piece that wasn't like normal, which is the 10x, you got to multiply by its derivative. So it's like a chain, it just keeps going out. And so this piece over here on the left is still fine, 6e to the 10x plus 6xe to the 10x, and then the derivative of 10x is just 10. Okay, so finally I have 6e to the 10x, 10 times 6 is 60, so 60 plus 60x e to the 10x. Look at how much more complicated the derivative of this function is compared to its original state. Much more complicated, right? Now this could be written out a little bit nicer because you see how there's an e to the 10x and a 6 factor in each of these. So I would be okay. This is certainly a correct answer, but you could probably write a little nicer by taking out a 6e to the 10x. And then you'd be left with a 1 here and then a 10 x here. And you can double check that 6e to the 10x times 1 would give you this. 6e to the 10x times this. The 6 and the 10 will give me 60. And then the x would multiply here and there's your 10x. So this would be a nicer looking final answer. All right, so this problem is an example of the product rule and then within that product rule we had to apply the chain rule. It could also go the other way around where you're doing a chain rule and then the inside function maybe is a product and you have to do the product rule on that. So it's not always going to be the same pattern over and over again. That's what I mean by you have to get comfortable with these. Okay, let's look at B. I think I'm going to need some space for B. So B is a quotient, right? This is our numerator. This is our denominator. So I'm going to apply the quotient rule first. I'm going to give myself lots of space just in case because this could get messy because I know the derivative of ln x is 1 over x, so I know there might be fractions without infractions. So I say, okay, g prime, I recognize it's a quotient, so using the quotient rule, I'm going to write this out as a product twice, ln x plus 5, whole thing times x, and then remember it's subtraction for the quotient rule, ln x plus 5, whole thing times x, and then divided by the denominator squared, First thing gets prime, second thing gets prime. Okay. Now it's time to start finding the actual derivatives that we get from the uh, quotient rule. ln x plus 5. Now, I know ln x, the derivative of that is 1 over x. So I'll say this is 1 over x plus 5, but because this isn't an x, i got to multiply by its derivative. x plus 5 prime. This is straight from 
this piece right here. So this piece became this whole piece. So even though I took the derivative, I still end up with a derivative inside. And now the x remains. And then I get minus ln of x plus 5 times the derivative of x, but that's just 1, so it's gone. I don't have to write out a 1 in a product. And then the x squared stays. Now it may feel like you can cancel right here, but you can't because there's not a factor of x in both. This x here is inside the ln. It's not the same thing as multiplying. Okay, what's going on over here? Well, this is 1 over x plus 5. And then the derivative of x plus 5, well, that's 1 plus 0, so it's just 1. So I don't have to write it again because it's just 1 over x plus 5 times 1. And then this is times x minus ln x plus 5 all over x squared. Okay, now the calculus at this stage is done. But this is certainly not simplified. There's a nicer way to write it. You don't want to leave fractions within fractions. You know, there's a couple different ways to do this. What I'm going to do is I'm going to come over here and rewrite it in a little bit of a way, a different way that we could see what's going on. I'm going to put the x on top of the x plus 5 instead of just multiplying on the outside. And then minus ln x plus 5 over x squared. That's not really a simplification. That's just a rewrite. Now, what I need to do is get this to be one fraction. But this isn't really a fraction. It's kind of is if it's over 1, right? So we need a common denominator. Since this has the only real useful denominator, x plus 5, the common denominator will be x plus 5, which means I need to multiply the top of this by x plus 5 and the bottom by x plus 5. So I'm going to multiply top by x plus 5 and the bottom by x plus 5. And I'm going to end up with x over x plus 5 minus x plus 5 times ln of x plus 5, which looks like you could do all kinds of stuff with it, but you really can't because this is trapped inside the ln. And then this is over x plus 5, and all of this is over x squared. But because I did this, now I can combine these because they have a like denominator, and so this is going to be x minus x plus 5 ln of x plus 5 all over x plus 5 and then all that's over x squared. None of the steps we've done so far are difficult, but I'm not saying that you look at this and you say it's easy. Each step is a basic algebra rule. We're just having to string a lot of them together. Remember, we finished our calculus way up here. Okay, now I'm almost there and it feels like you should cancel all kinds of stuff, right? This x plus 5 is trapped inside the ln, can't cancel there. This x plus 5 and this one you can't cancel because the x has no factor of x plus 5. You actually can't cancel anything right now. All I can do now to write it as a single fraction is say, okay, this x squared down here is like x squared over 1. And remember, to so divide two fractions, you keep the top. So all this stuff. And you multiply by this flip, the reciprocal. So finally, my final answer, and I can't really cancel anything, is x minus x plus 5 times ln of x plus 5 divided by x squared times x plus 5. Not pretty. Well, I guess the final answer is okay, but it's not pretty how we got here, but it is our final answer. And again, it feels like there's all this canceling that could take place, but unfortunately, there's no real factors here that could cancel. Even if you were to distribute the ln x plus 5 through here, you still would be stuck. So we're kind of stuck with this final answer that just feels like it could cancel stuff. Again, a little bit of algebra gymnastics. You have to be comfortable with algebra for this. But the key here, calculus-wise, was recognizing first it's a quotient, and then within the quotient was a chain rule problem. Okay, so let's look at one more that combines a couple of different rules. I'll clear this out. Okay, k of x, our part c. I see an inside function, x minus e to the 5x, and I see an outside function, which is something like x to the fourth power, meaning if this was just an x, That'd be really nice, because then it'd be x to the fourth. That's just 4x cubed. I'd be done, right? 
Okay, so how am I going to pull this off? Well, I'm going to pretend that if that was just an x, so I'll say, okay, if I want to take the derivative, which is what we're doing, finding the derivative, I say k prime of x would be 4, and I'd keep whatever this variable is. It's a lot more than a variable, though. And then I'd subtract 1 off the 4, and it'd be 3. But this wasn't just an x, so I have to multiply by its derivative, x minus e to the 5x prime. So that was an inside function. Okay, let me write out what I'm doing here. x minus e to the 5x cubed. Okay, now let's take this derivative. Derivative of x is 1. And then I need e to the 5x prime. Oh, but this is a, com a composite function because it's not just an e to the x. So I'm going to say it's e to the 5x, but i got to multiply by 5x prime. You see what just happened? Chain rule, and then we had to do the chain rule again. That happens every once in a while. Okay, so I get 4x minus e to the 5x cubed, and then I get a 1 minus, this is going to be 5, so I can write it as 5e to the 5x. Looking at this, I do not see a real nice way to simplify this. I think this is about as pretty as it will get. So I say this is my final answer. And notice, chain rule followed by chain rule. So in all of these final problems, again, we had to apply multiple rules. The first example, just chain rule once and we were good. These examples, chain rule combined with something else. You should be comfortable with both and, again, practice a variety of problems because there's no way for me to show you every different combination of rules we could possibly have. And that's where the practice comes in. So as you practice these, pay attention to what rules you're having to combine and when.